Hi, Julia. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Good. It's so fun to finally be on Blocking Heads. Oh, congratulations! On my for like a decade. I know you've been working toward this goal for just forever, and and but and I wanted dreaming to, of it, you know, at night. I didn't want to 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 grant this to you lightly. I wanted to make sure you had reached a, a level of achievement that truly warrants it, and I'm happy so to it report. Would feel meaningful. I happy to report that. that you are uh, at that level. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show. Uh, on the Blogging Heads platform, as you suggested, you are Julia Galef. Uh, you do the Rationally Speaking podcast. And I don't know, did you did you know that you are widely seen as a spokesperson for the rationalist community, a community I was not really aware of until a recent controversy we'll talk about? Did you know that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny. I... I try not actually to talk about myself as a rationalist or as being part of the rationalists um, for various reasons, um, but partly just because of what Paul Graham talks about in his essay, Keeping Your Identity Small. Mm, um, like, I don't mm. want to start identifying too much with any one tribe where I feel like I have to, like, defend it in a knee-jerk way. So I don't often talk about, you know, I don't start sentences like, as a rationalist, I mm-hmm. feel blah, blah, blah. Um, but then every now and then something happens in like the broader world outside the rationalists to like direct a a bunch of outside attention onto the community. And so then everyone starts talking about the rationalists. And then I feel compelled to sort of jump in and say, well, no, 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 here's what you're misunderstanding about the rationalists. We are blah, blah, blah. And so I have been kind of more publicly identifying myself as like a rationalist lately. Um, Even though in general, I try to keep that. You you may go tribal on us. It sounds like. I Sorry. You may go tribal on us after all, it sounds like. I'm going to try not to. Okay. Try not to. Let me, so let me, let me explain how I heard that you were a spokesperson uh, from rationalists. So there was this New York Times piece about this, uh, a blog called Slate Star Codex that has very recently morphed into a newsletter called, I think, Astral Codex 10. Uh, yes. By that's a, right. a guy. It's another anagram. Yeah, it's a rough anagram on Scott. Uh, what, what's it an anagram? I mean, I mean, Slate Star Codex was a rough anagram on Scott Alexander, which was the, so. the 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 name associated with the blog, although it was anonymous because uh, Scott and Alexander were just the first and middle names of the person. We now mm-hmm. know the last name is Siskin. Um, and uh, and what is is uh, is Astral Codex ten a what's that an anagram of? Do we know? I we don't know. I'm not positive. <laughs> so yeah. Something. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm sure there, there are people out there rational enough to solve yeah. this. I'm sure this someone's puzzle. preparing a comment as we speak to we speak. Uh, enlighten me. So anyway, uh, it's a I mean, do you do you want to tell the story of the controversy or or should I do you do you. Uh, I'd I, actually be I, I think it would be most interesting for me to hear. Your current okay. picture of the country. Because right. I'm, a, so that I'm kind know, of an outsider. Like, okay. Yeah, like what I what would be most interesting or useful for me to comment on or weigh in on okay. or you know maybe correct or something. Okay, so start at the very beginning uh, with my familiarity uh, with 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 this is years ago somebody said Slate Star Codex is is a really interesting blog. You should have the guy on Blogging Heads. I looked at it; it was interesting. I emailed him, and I didn't realize it was anonymous, and he didn't want publicity. He very kindly emailed back and said. He had read one of my books or something, but he was anonymous. Um, and then the next time it hit my radar screen in a big way was some months ago. There, I, I, I learned that uh, Scott Alexander, as he was known then, had said he was prepared to nuke his blog and destroy the archives or something because the New York Times was about to out him in the sense of revealing his actual name and his actual identity as a psychiatrist. Um, So that was kind of interesting. Um, And the New York Times never, never ran the piece. I mean, they had approached him, talked to him. And when he found out they wanted to reveal his name, he had uh, gotten kind of upset. uh, And apparently a lot of his followers had complained to New York Times, the reporter, the editor. Uh, We now know that the reporter felt quite besieged uh, by by the blowback. Uh, Mm -hmm. 
in any event, uh, the reporter whose name is Cade Metz, I think, um, mm-hmm. once Scott revealed his name, moved to the Substack platform, renamed the thing, New York Times figured, well, let's let's do a piece on this. Uh, it came out, um, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and I, I did not realize until reading it that the, the, the blog now newsletter was widely thought of as being embedded in this thing called the rationalist community. Mm-hmm. And the, the Times piece, I would say, well, it was certainly taken by people in the rationalist community as presenting an unflattering picture of the rationalist community. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott himself wrote something on his newsletter complaining about some of the characterizations of him. One, at least, uh, has the appearance of validity to me. I mean, I mean when he, the, 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 there's uh, the, the New York Times, uh, I, I, I've got it here. I should, I should read it if I can, if I can find it. Uh, it says, um, do I have it? Uh, oh, in one post, he, meaning Scott, this is from the New York Times, aligned himself with Charles Murray, who proposed a link between race and IQ and the bell curve. In another, he pointed out that Mr. Murray believes black people, quote, are genetically less intelligent than white people. You could read that and infer that uh, that Scott had aligned himself with Charles Murray on this particular issue of race and IQ. Scott says one that's not the case. One one, could, yes. what, what one naturally would, even though, yeah. strictly speaking, it's not you're rationalist. You, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure you can read that sentence and realize that it's not quite a logical implication of it that. Uh, yeah, but, that, but, but it's it certainly uh, one might say uh, your average reader is going to go away from that thinking that he endorsed this particular view of Charles Murray. So that seems to me not fair. Or there just some, that he endorsed Charles Murray's views in general or something right, like that. I, right. I think if you just asked random readers, like, what do you think the sentence means? I think they would say something like that. Yeah. So yeah. that was and uh, not so, like. He endorsed some unspecified belief of Charles Murray's, which is not the one this sentence talks about. Like, I don't think that's a very natural <laughs> reading of the sentence. <laughs> no, and that would have been a strange sentence to appear to be yeah. put it that way. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so I did a ver- uh, you know a podcast, a write show with Will Wilkinson, just because I saw Will react on Twitter. Okay, so there was the blowback from the rationalists, whom we will describe and discuss. Mm-hmm. Uh, on Twitter, Will tweeted something like, oh, it's it's interesting to see these rationalists get so emotional, which was kind of funny. Um, I didn't and, see that tweet. And, 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 all, and I knew that Will had a kind of conversancy in this community, generally speaking, even though I hadn't known about the community per se until recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, you know, I had him on my show. And indeed, he had been involved with some of the players early on personally. Um, and, and he certainly was conversant in the milieu. Uh, he had a somewhat critical perspective. Uh, he agrees that the thing I just quoted, uh, was, I think he said it was probably not fair, but he, but he was generally defending the New York Times piece as a not bad piece of journalism. And he, and anyway, in any event, Will has, has kind of drifted away to the extent that he was ever involved with what became the rationalist community. He's drifted away a little himself. Uh, and so it was a critical perspective. So then I got some blowback on Twitter for having Will be the person who would talk to me about this. For, the blowback was from rationalists. And they were, and I'd said at the end of the, the, the podcast, I'd be happy to talk to rationalists. And so they said, well, we'll do it. And 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 they were throwing out names. And one of them said, Julia Galef, have a conversation with Julia Galef. And several people chimed in. Yes, yes, she is our leader. No, they didn't quite say that. But <laughs> But that was the drift I got is that you would be mm-hmm. a very, uh, a very capable and reliable, uh, uh, not necessarily spokesperson, but uh, 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 give me a, an alternative perspective from Wills and uh, speak knowledgeably about this whole thing. Now, having laid that out, maybe you'll want to correct me or add things or something. I mean, that was pretty accurate. Uh, I think. I mean, well, one thing I would point out, which you may have intended, but I'm not sure if it was clear in your summary, was that uh, so there was a lot of back and forth between Scott and the journalist Cade Metz um, and also between a bunch of other people, including myself and Cade Metz, Mm. um, you know, off the record uh, about whether 
why and whether it was necessary for the New York Times to print Scott's full name, which he had been trying to keep hidden. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so part of the confusion was due to the fact that it, Cade described it as the policy of the paper to print the the full name of in situations like this. Um, But other people pointed to instances in which that seemed very similar, you know, in which the paper was covering a blogger or someone else who used a pseudonym online um, and they didn't print the full name. And so there was some confusion about, well, why in this case are you insistent on printing Scott's full name when he so very much doesn't want it printed? Mm -hmm. Um, And he did. I think he had some very legitimate reasons for not wanting his full name printed. Um, For one, because he, you know, at the time, well, he's still a psychiatrist, but at the time he was working at uh, a practice uh, where, you know, if, if, he had patients who Googled his his real name as a psychiatrist. And the first thing that came up in the search results was this New York Times article about a blog, you know, potentially portraying it as controversial. Then right. I can see how that would be a, a professional liability. Um, he's also, Scott's also gotten, you know, some harassment and, uh, and, you know, like unpleasant communication from people on the internet before. So, you know, it's a little like dangerous or unnerving to have people know your full name and be able to, find where you live and work and so on. So uh, I think Scott had some very legitimate reasons for not wanting them to print his full name and also had a pretty legitimate case that this was not like a general universal policy the paper followed. So this wouldn't be a violation of it. Um, And so uh, the fact, the way you described it was accurate that Scott uh, left his practice, the place he was working and started his own practice so that he could uh, use his real name with less worry about, you know, getting fired by his job. Um, and that's after that point, the New York Times printed their article, which had been kind of, it seemed like on the back burner for some months. Um, but the way that Cade Metz's article portrayed it was sort of that Scott, uh, that Scott's move to start his own practice and, and print his real name, you know, on the internet willingly kind of gave the lie to the fact that he didn't want it done in the first place that he had been, I don't know, putting up a a fight for no reason just to be difficult or something. Um, Because see, he was willing to reveal his real name. Um, But the causality is all backwards because the reason that he finally decided to reveal his real name um, was only after he realized, okay, the world's going to do this to me, whether I like it or not. I might as well change my entire life so that this will be less damaging when it happens, after which point the New York Times printed the article with his name. So... Uh, I, I felt it was a little bit disingenuous for the article to not make it clear that Scott felt his hand had kind of been forced. Um, uh, okay. And then, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, I, so I don't I, think, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think the Times story explicitly said, uh, well, he's, you know, now he's willing to reveal his name, but there was, it, it actually ended. I think it was the last sentence of the piece said reveal yeah. that now, and now he's, he's revealed his name and it was, it was meant to be resonant in a certain way that that may be the way you describe. I I I, I yeah. agree. But um, so yeah. So let me um, before we uh, get your view on what the rationalists are and aren't, let me say a little about the way they're presented in the um in the in the piece. So first of all, let me, let me read a few paragraphs. Uh, that give a sense for how the the Times piece describes its own significance in a way, like why this is worth reading, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, Metz writes, uh, Slate Star Codex was a window into the Silicon Valley psyche. There are good reasons to try and understand that psyche because the decisions made by tech companies and the people who run them eventually affect millions. And Silicon Valley, a community of iconoclasts, is struggling to decide what's off limits for all of us. At Twitter and Facebook, leaders were reluctant to remove words from their platforms, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they released products, including facial recognition systems, uh, even while knowing they can be biased against women and people of color and, 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 uh, and, and sometimes uh, spew hateful speech. And then he writes, why hold anything back? That was often the answer a rationalist would arrive at. So uh, I, I maybe haven't set this up well enough, but, but he's saying... You know, he's saying this rationalist community is a big deal in Silicon Valley. The blog has had a big readership in Silicon Valley uh, and Silicon Valley matters. They're, they're, they're uh, deciding uh, issues about free speech and, and so on. 
And, uh, and, and what he seems to be saying here is, and according to the rationalist community, anything goes. Um, there, there should be, I guess he's saying, uh, there should be no constraints, uh, on, on what, I don't know, what Silicon Valley does according to the rationalist community. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But anyway, then he writes, and perhaps the clearest and most influential place to watch that thinking unfold was on Scott Alexander's blog. So the idea is Silicon Valley matters. This is a window onto Silicon Valley. And the rationalist community tells you a lot about the perspective of Silicon Valley. And then he goes on to depict the rationalist community. He definitely finds some favorable things to say about it or has other people say them. And he has people say some unfavorable things about the rationalist community. Um, the, uh, in particular that there's a, and, and he doesn't ascribe this to the whole community, I think, but there's, that there's a, a neo reactionary, an element called the neo reactionary element, the dark enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, these people seem to be like not in favor of democracy. I, I guess they want, they think we should rule like by a philosopher king or something. He doesn't, he doesn't say that, but I, I don't know. I don't know what they believe. You can explain all that to me, but, um, he, uh, you know, the idea is uh, they're very anti-social justice warrior, which is probably by and large true, um, uh, I, would, I would guess. But uh, he says some more things. But, but why don't I stop there and get your take on that? Yeah. So there were a few things that seemed surprising um, and maybe a little misleading in that framing. No, not not your framing, you are accurately describing the framing of the article. Um, so the the sort of Silicon Valley framing of it, I think surprised a lot of people, including me, because um, like, yes, there's a, a significant like cluster of people in Silicon Valley who are fans of Scott's blog, and I know some of them, um, but it's, it's like far from a majority read blog in Silicon Valley. Uh, I don't know, if I had to guess, I'd say maybe like, I don't know, five percent of people at tech companies read it or something um like it's popular but it's popular popular like in a little niche so Mm -hmm. i wouldn't describe it as like a defining a blog that like captures the zeitgeist of silicon valley or anything like that um and you know it has fans in tons of other countries and other industries and government and so on so uh the silicon valley connection was like a little tenuous Mm -hmm. um and you know scott started the blog when he wasn't in the Bay Area at all. So a lot of the posts that were, you know, referenced or quoted in the article had no relation to Silicon Valley whatsoever. Scott was like living in a random city being a psychiatrist at the time. So um, that's one thing. The uh, the next thing you were talking about was the focus on like anti-social justice, you know, anything goes just dis- like approach to discussing controversial topics. V- but- very anti-cancel culture. I- I'm sure that's probably true of pretty much all of them, right? Anti-cancel culture. Well, so another kind of weird thing about the framing of the article was that if you read it and had never, you know, didn't have any experience reading Scott's blog, I think you would quite understandably come away with the perception that it's a blog about like controversial culture war issues. Um, and Scott has mm. blogged about those things, but they're, they're definitely a much. small minority of the total things he talks about. Yeah. Like most it's of largely, a, it's about, a very, it's a very sciencey kind of, you know, He's interested in human behavior. He's interested in what science can tell us about human behavior. He's interested in tech issues like AI. And, 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 and I would say that kind of thing is more dominant than, than explicit commentary on political issues. So far as the blog itself goes. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's interested in political theory. He's interested in, um, in like ethics and meta ethics philosophy. Mm-hmm. He's interested in um, how to reason better. So there's a bunch of posts on there about like, you know, making predictions and checking them and getting better calibrated and running adversarial collaborations where people who disagree about some issue, you know, work together to try to set up some test to, you know, try to converge uh, on their opinions. Um, it, it's a really varied, varied blog. Um, and so, like, I understand why Cade Metz focused on the, you know, posts that, that are about culture war issues. Um, but but it's, I think it's misleading to portray that as like the focus of the blog because it's not. So right. that's worth pointing. Yeah. And, then, and, and yeah. I, I think distinctions were made and certainly Will Wilkinson in his conversation with me made very clear distinctions between the blog 
and the various elements of the so-called rationalist community. Um, and Will himself uh, has a very high opinion of Scott, not such a high opinion of certain other people in the in the community and the and their and their thinking. Um, yeah, I, well, actually, I maybe. Yeah. Maybe another thing to add um, is that the the article was also, I thought, kind of misleading in who counts as part of the rationalist community. And uh-huh. again, I don't know that this was I, I don't know that there was a lie there, um, but there were a bunch of people who are kind of prominent in Silicon Valley, like Balaji, um, who were who were talked about in the article. And Balaji is a fan of Scott's blog, but Balaji would not consider himself a rationalist, I'm sure. And, huh. I, you know, he's not he's not that like socially connected to the rationalists. He I don't think he like agrees with the rationalists on a lot of core issues. Um, so, you know, the connection there that I guess justified him being included in the article was that he's in Silicon Valley and he likes Scott's blog. Um, and well, there was, was another connection in that case. Now, this is Balaji. Is it Srini Vasa? I don't know how he pronounces his last yeah, name exactly. I was, I was trying to avoid pronouncing him, therefore <laughs> well, mispronouncing his last name. Then I'll, then I'll be the one who fails yeah. to pronounce it accurately. The, the, um, he's what, like a VC guy? And, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, we should explain another reason he, he entered, uh, the, the Times reporter's radar screen is that, uh, you know, I think TechCrunch did an unflattering story on the specific, the neo-reactionary element. And apparently in an email exchange with, uh, the, the leading neo-reactionary, whatever, Curtis, whatever, whatever is uh, this prominent, uh, Near, near reactionary whose name I don't exactly remember, but um, apparently this uh, Srinivasan, if that's correct, emailed to him the following, uh, which was leaked to the New York Times, quote, if things get hot, it may be interesting to sick the dark enlightenment. That's another name for the neo reactionaries to sick the dark enlightenment audience on a single vulnerable hostile reporter to dox them and turn them inside out with hostile reporting sent to their, uh, emphasized to their advertisers, friends, contacts. Uh, now that was, I think, not in, in reference to Mets, but we should add that Mets makes it clear in this piece. As I said, he felt very, like uh he felt the blowback very heavily from the initial uh uh the piece that he the version piece he didn't write when when Scott Alexander publicized the fact that he was going to write it a lot a lot of people in Metz's view kind of descended on him in hostile fashion and and complicated his life and and, and in fact one thing will said uh, I thought will did a good job yeah go ahead go ahead I don't want to derail sure. you too much i'll just very quickly interject that um i don't approve of that email i'm sure, oh, sure. scott doesn't approve of that email um and i you know no it's i understand creepy. why kate included that in the story because it's like a good example of someone in silicon valley being i don't know uh unreasonable and hostile to the tech industry and maybe behaving badly uh but again i think the connection to slate star codex or to scott or to the rationalists is tenuous Anyway, okay, but go on, go yeah. on. You were saying about Will. Yeah, I mean, I will say other kinds of connections to Silicon Valley Mets trots out are like uh, uh, Peter Thiel has funded some of the early, he's kind of seminal rationists like Eliezer Yudkowsky. Um, there's that. Yeah. You, you funded Miri for for some years, yeah. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, anyway, Will had an interesting theory. Uh, we had two interesting theories about um, one was like what happened in Kate, Kate Metz's mind that led to this piece. And, and, and it was this, that like he gets this blowback mm-hmm. and he's like, who the hell are these people? And he looked you know, and, and well, this is partly my theory and partly Will's, but, 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 okay. but, 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 it's like, not, I, I guess I, what I would say is it's not surprising that a human being who feels besieged by a community goes on to do a, 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 an unflattering depiction of the community. That's human nature for better or worse. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying if you sick, a, you know, if a bunch of, uh, of, of if, if an army uh, a blowback descends on you, that's probably not going to get them better press next time around when you write about it. That's just, that's just life. I, I think that we'll, is understandable, but I. I do think it's still incumbent on you on the, as the journalist course, to distinguish between who are the people who are, you know, of harassing me 
and make sure that when you're describing the community, you're Absolutely. not the two. Anyway. Absolutely. But I've noticed that uh, journalists like the rest of us are human beings. The um, Will's theory was a little uh, more flattering to Mets. It was more like uh, he actually saw some of the dark aspects in the course of the blowback and and the, and they became part of the story. I I, I, I I shouldn't put words in Will's mouth, but it's like, you know, oh, well, here are the neo reaction. Well, I mean, uh, this guy, Srinivasan, is is, is uh, a good example. You're saying he was wrongly connected to the rationalist community. But, you know, that's the way this works. Uh, that's that's the way human nature works, too. It's like yeah. when you're besieged by people. You're very ready to draw connections among the various people besieging you, right? And that, that's a, a that's a form of cognitive bias in a certain sense, although I don't know that it has a, a name. But um, you know, and and in fact, Metz goes on to say, "Well, hey, uh, Andreessen Horowitz has a connection to Srinivasan. They also have a connection to Substack, which which recruited Scott onto their platform to do the newsletter." So he's mm -hmm. he's seen plenty of Silicon Valley connections by the end of this. I'm not defending the, the piece. I'm just saying uh, I think that may have something to do with the way the psychology worked for, for better yeah. or worse. Um, well, I mean, if he if the piece had been about Silicon Valley um, and Slate Star Codex was mentioned in the piece as, you know, here's an example of a blog that many people in this part of Silicon Valley like, uh, I wouldn't really have an issue with that. Like, it's just the, the framing that the blowback was from the rationalists or from or somehow. Well, the some was. I mean, Scott, Scott I mean, did. Scott yeah. encouraged people to get in touch with them. Now, Scott did say, be nice. OK. Yeah. He didn't he did say that. he did. He did. I think, of course, so, people being people, actually, again, you, yeah. you can't control that either. But uh, go ahead. So I, I think this is an interesting question, which I was thinking about before our call. Um what do I think Scott should have done differently? Like, and I'm, I'm curious for your take on that too, um, because I don't know, it's easy in hindsight to say like, oh, Scott should have predicted that, you know, some of his readers would, would see his post and would harass the New York Times. Um, and so he shouldn't have done that. To be totally honest, I don't know if I would have made a better call myself if I was in that situation, like a priori without the benefit of hindsight. Um, and so I guess I'm just wondering, what should the policy be? Like, if you if you think that The New York Times is you know, going to do something unfair and damaging. Um, is it OK to, like, say to your followers, hey, uh, you know, The New York Times is going to do this thing I think is unfair and damaging. If you agree, I encourage you to email, you know, the editor um, and please be nice, like be polite, be respectful. But like they should hear your voice if you just described that to me beforehand, I would have been like, yeah, that seems that seems like a reasonable way to, you know, give feedback to The New York Times if you think they're doing something bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I don't know. I'm just wondering, what do you what do you think the policy should be in a case like this? What do I think the Times' policy should be? No, 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 no. Like, uh, what, uh, what should our policy be um, in situations where, you know, The New York Times, like, we think the New York Times is going to do something yeah. bad, yeah. like unfairly dock someone or something like that. Um, is there a way we can, you know, like, I think it's, a, you know, pressure them to change their mind. It is, it is uh, a time honored uh, reaction in America to try to get people who agree with you to lobby on your behalf. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I don't I don't. I don't see anything necessarily wrong with that. And, and it's an interesting and delicate question, like like the question of anonymity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know that the Times did have a clear rule on whether they had to uh, respect his anonymity. I mean, an important distinction someone has made since is that, well, OK, the Times can say it wasn't hard to discover the real identity of Scott Alexander. So what news is being broken here? But as somebody pointed out, that's not the same as saying it was easy for Scott Alexander Siskin's patients to discover that he was Scott Alexander, right? right? That, it, right. That, that information was not uh, so readily available to them. So it was blowing his cover. And, right. and now what Will suggested, this is the other interesting theory Will had. I, I, I thought Will did a good job of perspective taking uh, on, 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 on both sides. This theory may not be right, but it's an interesting one, which is that um, 
yes, Scott was concerned about suddenly his patients knowing he has this other identity and maybe he said some mm-hmm. things they don't agree with and some that are controversial. But Will suggested, well, maybe he's also aware of what is the case, that his blog is embedded in a larger community. There are lots of comments on the blog. And some of those are from from people that Will considers unsavory with unsavory views. And maybe Scott does. But in any event, uh, maybe maybe Scott is aware that there's the problem of him being unmasked in front of his patients. There's also the problem of him being judged by the overall context, including uh, comments that actually has no control over. You know, if he if he has an open kind of comment policy, they maybe shouldn't be judged by them. But but that's maybe going to happen and in a way did happen in the second New York Times piece. So that was an interesting. Uh, the theory, theory. <laughs> just to make sure I'm understanding it, the theory is that what Scott was worried about wasn't actually. It wasn't what he said it was. No, it was, it, instead... it, it, may, it was it was what he said it was, but maybe plus the fear that 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 what happened would happen. In other words, uh, people, rather than saying, here is exactly what Scott Alexander has said, period, would say, mm-hmm. there's these other people, including neo-reactionaries, who read his blog approvingly and comment, and maybe he's interacted with them in the comment section, who knows, whatever. But uh, that, that, that that was part of the 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 the, the, the reason. In, in Will's theory, this is one reason Scott freaked out and mm-hmm. and threatening to nuke the blog that that was the idea that's one reason not the only reason in this um, theory i mean i i don't think it's that crazy to to think that uh you know or let me rephrase that i it seems a little unreasonable to me to say that if you're not doing anything wrong you should be fine with all of your patients uh you know being aware of your right. blog and so on like I think there can be like perfectly like reasonable cases where someone is not doing anything wrong, but their blog is still, you know, covering topics or they're expressing thoughts that it would be, you know, weird and uncomfortable if their patients were all reading. So I I don't necessarily see any reason here to, you know, be suspicious of Scott's claim that it would be bad for his patients to easily discover his blog. Um, Oh, I don't. I don't think. I don't think we'll like, denies that. I think his the, the theory is meant to be supplementary. The the, the second yeah. part of the, of the theory, not not a, an alternative theory. The yeah. um. So why don't you? Okay, so that's the controversy. Um, why don't you tell us what the rationalist community really is, in your view, to the extent that it's a cohesive community that we can even describe? Yeah, that's a good caveat um, because. <laughs> So the the term rationalist arose maybe what's it 2021 now uh, it arose maybe like 13 years ago something like that um, as a term for the kind of loosely defined cluster of people mostly online but to some extent in person uh, who who were kind of clustered around the blogs uh, overcoming bias and then less wrong which spun off of overcoming bias um, and the, the the reason that they end up referring to themselves as rationalists. Uh, is because the kind of central focus of especially less wrong to a lesser extent overcoming bias was rationality, um, which is a, a very loaded word that means different things in different contexts to different people. But the meaning in this case uh, was the meaning in various academic circles of rationality, which is, um, to put it simply, the study of uh, how to reason accurately and how to make effective decisions, like decisions that like effectively pursue your goals. Mm-hmm. Um, and those two kinds of r- rationality are respectively epistemic rationality and instrumental rationality. So this is rationality as it's defined in like the Oxford handbook of thinking and reasoning. Um, and it's and, not, yeah. And what does that distinction mean exactly? I mean, epistemic between would seem to yeah. refer to how you come to know things and, 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 and instrumental would be how you deploy the knowledge or what? Yeah. It's like having true beliefs versus making good decisions would be a, okay. a simple way to put it. Okay. Um, and they're related in interesting ways, but not the same. Um, so, right. So this, you know, loosely defined cluster of people uh, who liked to read on and comment on and discuss uh, on and around these blogs, less wrong, overcoming bias around, I don't know, 2007, 2009, um, started calling themselves rationalists uh, because 
the study of rationality was kind of the defining feature of those conversations. And uh, one uh, kind of frustrating thing that's happened in the years since is that people uh, hear the label rationalist and they reasonably infer from that, oh, this must be like rationalist must be downstream of rationalism. There must be an ideology called rationalism hmm. um, and people who adhere to that ideology are the rationalists. And so they'll ask things like, well, so what do rationalists believe? Um, or like, what does rationalism say? And the people in this, you know, community of, I don't know, a, a few thousand people or something hear that question. And, and it's just like confusing to us because we're like, well, there's no ideology that we signed up for or anything. Mm. We're, we're interested in rationality. Let me try to explain to you what rationality is. And then the people are like, well, but no, no, no. Like what do, what defines the rationalist? What is the, the shared belief? Um, so I can, uh, and you know, maybe this will be interesting. I can kind of talk about some of the common threads, some of the like distinctive features of the community. I just wanted to be clear that there's not like an ideology called rationalism that people sure. are adhering to that makes them rationalists. It's sort in of, fact, it's like a hybrid, uh, a hybrid yeah. ideological term slash social community term just to describe this cluster of people. No, that um, would be good. In fact, I think Scott Alexander once did a post saying, uh, I think with, with a kind of, a, that had a lot of merit. I think he started out, uh, making a point that is a hobby horse of mine is that like when you see a newspaper say, well, the, the, the Shia and the Sunni disagree over who the rightful successor to the prophet. Well, yeah, that is the doctrinal issue. But in fact, they are people who are just bound by a whole bunch of other things. And in any given country, it may be that there's a particular yeah. socioeconomic difference that by, and, and so on. And he made a kind of analogy that like, yes. So in the end, rationalists, have become a bunch of people who hang out together and talk. And, and I think the idea was, you know, they don't agree on everything and, 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 and so on. I, I, I believe I didn't read the whole thing, but I think maybe I have the gist right. It so, was long. You're yeah, forgiven. as, as, as his uh, posts sometimes are. Um, the, uh, so why do you, yeah, why don't you go ahead? What are some things you would say a fair number of rationalists tend to believe or do? I would say Probably the most important, um, like the closest to a sort of defining uh, ethos or feature of the community is a uh, an adherence to certain kind of norms of discourse. Um, like if you're going to be participating in conversations in the rationalist community, you have to, you know, uh, be trying to argue in good faith. Uh, like you can't be using ad hominem attacks here and there, you can't be, you know, calling people a moron and an idiot if they disagree with you. Um, you have to be like willing to to describe, you know, where your belief comes from. Um, if not, like cite a bunch of studies, which is often not possible or feasible. Um, at least talk about like, here's why this seems plausible to me, or here's where I think my intuition is coming from. Um, you have to try not to straw man the people you're talking to. Like, try to accurately represent the view that you're disagreeing with. Um, and, you know, you have to like not get offended when people ask you questions like, uh, you know, how confident are you in that? Or like, what do you think about this objection? So, uh, so these are all norms that, that sort of help with the, the goal of having accurate beliefs as a community. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, I think sometimes this is the source of tension when uh people who don't share those norms, like come into rationalist comment sections um, and then feel like they're being, uh, they're unwelcome uh, because they're, you know, not following this really rather like weird and specific set of, uh, of discourse norms. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, adherence to those norms is probably the most important thing. And then if I were to pick one other like shared belief, I would probably be, it is possible. So Human reasoning by default is flawed. Um, it evolved for various purposes, um, none of which were like figuring out the scientific truth of a complicated matter. Um, and so when we, you know, try to reach conclusions, um, now in the modern world about complicated things, uh, that we didn't evolve to reason about, we're very often wrong. And, uh, and we have all these various biases. And so, uh, 
we are trying to, it, it is possible to improve on default human reasoning by learning various habits and techniques um, and creating community norms that help correct for these biases. Um, and that's like a good and valuable thing to do. And we should be trying to do it. Um, so notably, this, this belief set does not include we are rational, um, which is also another yeah. understandable misunder way that people misunderstand no, but, what rationalists are about. Um, yeah, but I got to say, you do get that vibe sometimes from, the, you know, uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky in the early, in the dawn of blogging heads, like, I mean, more than 10 years ago, I think used to come on and I didn't know, I didn't know who he, I, 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 I'm not the person who brought him on. The, uh, you know, I, I was an interesting guy. I think I had one dialogue with him myself. It was interesting. Yeah. He was interesting, but he did exude this sense that if everyone could be as rational as I am, right? I mean, maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm wrong and I'm misremembering or, and, and look, we all, who's to say what, sense is actually being exuded that's a matter of interpretation but yeah. um i i got that sense along along with the sense that he actually had some kind of eccentric int- uh, concerns about like like uh, uh ai and stuff but um yeah. do you, do, I, I don't want to do disagree with you totally, about that like i think yeah. i think eliezer does rub a lot of people the wrong way yeah. um and i can i think he doesn't rub me the wrong way as much as He's in some ways endearing. But but when I, yeah, I mean, when I read some of his, especially some of his earlier posts or when I watch some of his earlier appearances, I can see like what rubs people the wrong way. Um, And I don't think he would mind me saying that. Uh, But, you know, it's, there's a spectrum. There's like a bunch of different people in the rationalist community. I think Eliezer is more on one end of the gives the impression of arrogance. Um, But there's a lot of people towards the other end. But he so, is, but he is depicted both in the Times and in other places as a really central figure in the origin of this you know, community. Yes, yeah, absolutely. He's he's quite central. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, um, anyway, uh, okay. So, uh, so far it sounds good. We'd like to overcome the various cognitive and perceptual biases uh, that make the human brain not an automatically good thinking machine. Thanks to yeah. The legacy of natural selection, and we would like Hence the name less wrong. By the way, no, that was so that doesn't mean who, like we are less wrong than other people. It means we are trying to become less wrong. And whose blog was that? Uh, that I guess it was started that, by Eliezer. I mean, it was a okay. community blog. That was so Eliezer, and, and then uh, overcoming bias was uh, Robin uh, Hanson. Robin Hanson. Okay. Yeah. Um. Which yeah. And bias meant like, not like it meant cognitive bias, not not like yeah, other kinds, but um. As I understand Cogn- it, right? Cognitive right. motivational yeah. bias. Yeah. Um, so one, and, and one, then Scott, so Scott used to post on Less Wrong um, back yeah. in like, I don't know, 2012, 2013. And then he started his own blog, Slate Star Codex, um, which kind of spun off of that. So grew out of that. Um, oh, I see. So that, in that sense, uh, Eliezer is kind of, is kind of seminal. Okay. That, that sense too. So um, one more thing. Can you talk about a little bit Bayesian? Uh, the word Bayesian uh, uh, appears a lot in um, maybe more in the early stuff. Uh, I don't know, but it, it's an important uh, Bayesian logic, Bayesian analysis, right? What does that mean to, can you explain that uh, in a way that a layperson might understand it and tell us I why it matters? And certainly try. Yeah. Uh, so, so Bayesian is a reference to Bayes rule or Bayes theorem, um, which is a very simple theorem in probability theory. Um, and it, it, it basically tells you how much, if you have a certain amount of confidence in a belief, um, any belief, like, uh, it's going to rain tomorrow, or I'm going to get that job, or he's telling the truth, whatever, any belief, um, whatever level of confidence you have at, on that belief, uh, Bayes theorem tells you how you should adjust that, how much you should adjust that confidence up or down when you get new information that's mm-hmm. relevant, new evidence. Um, and so, uh, Specifically, the thing you should be paying attention to, to to decide how much more or less confident to be in your belief is the ratio between how likely the new evidence would be if your belief was true compared to how likely the new evidence would be if your belief was false. So uh, I can go I can go on more if you want, but yeah. probably what you're more interested in is like what is meant when we talk about yeah that, that's actually- or Bayesian thinking. That's yeah. actually a subtle thing you just said. I mean, it, it, I think it's related to the construction of like a confidence interval in statistics or something, or uh, it, it, it's, um, but anyway, the, the, the uh, 
the the broader um uh the broader i i mean is, is some of it to 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 bring it down to a cruder level kind of frustration with people who view things in binary terms it's like i'm seeing a lot of this in the pandemic right it's like mm-hmm. uh it's like i can't leave the house everyone has cooties uh you know as opposed to like well actually any one encounter with someone has, gives me an exceedingly small probability of getting covid so if i have a very small number of encounters i can leave the house um the uh so that, that's a case in which you know something that i try to do a lot and i think a lot of um people in the rationalist community try to do a lot is to uh not be too quick to assume that someone else's belief or someone else's behavior is irrational mm-hmm. um, and to ask like what what sort of premises or what you know preferences might they have that would make this belief or behavior rational so in the case of someone who doesn't uh doesn't want to leave the house at all for covid uh i don't know especially because it's a hypothetical example but i think there are a bunch of reasons a bunch of things that could be true that would make that a, a perfectly reasonable way to behave like someone could just have like strong risk uh, aversion, aversion where which they is just they don't like yeah they don't like right. taking um taking even moderate risks which right. you might disagree with but it's hard to say whether that's objectively rational or irrational it's a preference uh-huh. um they also might you know have reason to believe that covid is more contagious than it actually is and when i say reason to believe they might like have sources that they trust that are giving them them that impression um mm-hmm. and so again this is sort of where bayes rule or bayesian reasoning comes in um, part of it involves recognizing that people's beliefs are are formed based on their prior beliefs. And so the way they interpret evidence will depend on, you know, what they believed before. And so someone can be actually following a pretty reasonable process of Bayesian updating, of, of revising their beliefs in response to evidence. But if they started out with different priors than you, different prior beliefs, they can end up at a different conclusion that might seem unreasonable to you. Um so ironically, I believe both that, you know, irrationality and bias and so on are are significant and, and totally widespread. And also that in any particular case, in any particular example, um, it's often quite hard to know with confidence that someone's belief is irrational or that their behavior is irrational. So that's Be- a tangent, because, but I thought because it was like you, because you need, you, Yeah, is that because you're supposed to accept their priors as a given, like, it's up to them what their what their initial assessment of probability may have been. I mean, it does seem to me you could argue with people's priors, right? That they're just inconsistent you, with the evidence. Um, yeah, no, you could. I mean, I often have suspicions that people's priors were formed in in bad ways, um, but that's. But usually, the disagreement is over. Like, in this case, are they reacting properly to the evidence? Um, mm-hmm. That's a different question from you know over the course of their life did they form their worldview in a, in a bad way that's mm-hmm. causing them to react this way in, in this case. So I'm just trying to make that distinction. Okay. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, usually, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Well, let me, so let me were, ask. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. I was just saying this was sort of a, a, a tangent from the example you were giving of, of, oh. you know, black and white thinking. Um, and you yeah. were suggesting the, the focus well, but, on Bayesianism was an, an attempt to, move away from that was that what you were saying the idea that thinking probabilistically is very often the rational way to think rather than thinking certainly um, um yes i i would i would say it is um yeah which is not used yeah that's a cruder notion than bayesianism but it's it's in the spirit it's of it. it it's like an important premise yeah. of bayesian yeah. thinking that your beliefs should be probabilistic you shouldn't be 100 percent certain uh of anything so right. uh yeah um, so that, that's that's just like the basic Bayes rule. And then um, the focus on Bayesian reasoning in the community was, I guess, partly it probably had to do with um, the interest in artificial intelligence and and computer programming and, you know, what sort of an ideal Bayesian reasoner, uh, if you could program such a thing, um, how, how an ideal Bayesian reasoner would uh, form conclusions and interpret evidence. So that, that's a theory about how it became... Um, widespread in the in the community, but uh, just speaking in practice about like why why it is important and valuable. Um, partly, it's the focus on thinking kind of in grayscale and not in black and white, as you as you pointed out. Um, and it's also you know just 
the way that you react to new evidence is very different if you're trying to be Bayesian than if you're not. Mm -hmm. Um, I've spoken about this recently, but the kind of default way that people interpret new evidence is just to ask themselves, is this consistent with what I already believe, you know, Uh, or, or like, can this, can I find a way for this to be consistent with what I already believe? And asking yourself that question, which is the typical question people ask, makes it very easy to just fit everything into your pre-existing narrative. Um, but Which is a human instead, tendency anyway, thanks to confirmation. Bias. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, but if instead you're you're at least implicitly thinking about Bayes' rule, um, you're you're asking yourself not just like how consistent is this evidence with my belief being true, but also if I imagine my belief being false, um, how consistent is this evidence with that world? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's it's that extra step um, okay. where you're imagining that you're wrong and. And asking how consistent is the evidence with that, um, that I think is like a, a very important corrective step, um, corrective on our, our kind of default intuition. Um, so I forget your original question. Were you asking why? No, like, I was just, uh, the, the term comes up I, I, and I think it's, it's good to know both what Bayesian means and also to get a sense that it also just in a, in a vaguer way captures some of the spirit of the enterprise. Yeah. Uh, let's, you know, take in each new piece of evidence, update your beliefs. Uh, very rarely do we know anything for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a messy process. Like I do want to emphasize that, you know, when you, when we talk about adjusting your beliefs up or down a little bit or a lot, there's not like, we're not keeping track of the spreadsheet of exactly what our confidence is in every belief after, mm-hmm. and updating that after every single new piece of information we receive. So I guess another premise is that trying to do this process, you know, subjectively messily is better than not trying to do it at all. Um, but that, that is, that's an empirical question. It could be wrong, but I think it's probably better. Okay. Let me, let me ask you um, another question. Do you see any connection between the, the rationalists and what has uh, come to be called the intellectual dark web? Um, they're, they are different communities. Um, I, I guess they share, like, they share at least superficially a, a focus on, you know, the value of, like, reasoning and, and evidence. Um, I, you know, maybe this is my rationalist bias talking, but I I don't feel like, on average, the intellectual dark web crowd is, is being as careful um, or as, like, self-reflective or self-critical as rationalists try to be. But again, I'm, I'm a rationalist, so maybe I'm biased. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, this is another reason why I'm, even though sometimes it's frustrating when people criticize rationalists, um, this is another reason why I'm kind of like sympathetic uh, or, or like I'm, I'm understanding um, of that, even if I think the criticism is unfair, because I think, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of other groups out there that are not that related to the rationalists who use very similar language about like rationality and reason and evidence and so on. And in my opinion, a lot of those people are are like doing a terrible job (laughs) of the whole (laughs) notice your biases, try to correct your reasoning and so on. And so I can totally understand how, like, even if the rationalists are as good as I think we are, I can totally understand how an outsider, it would not be obvious to an outsider that we're like this exception or, you know, we're, we're not just the same thing as all the other people on the internet who say things like, you know, speaking rationally, uh, here is, you know, mm-hmm. what the obvious truth is. Um, so, yeah. So I, I guess, I, yeah. Get it. I mean, I mean, one reason the, the IDW came to mind is it is another group that gives you the sense that they're devoted to, you know, rational thought and 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 i'm a little more conversant in the idw than i am in the rationalists and in my view it turns out to be in their case that i think they're over overstating as as you kind of suggested i don't know that you meant to say this but but it's again it's a spectrum like there's some people in idw who i think like do a pretty good job of this and there's other people who i think don't and i'm like claiming that on average i don't think they're as you know careful or self-critical as rash or self-reflective as rationalists but i did a piece for wired uh, I, I uh, 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 earned Sam Harris's uh, enduring, I think, uh, probably antagonism by doing a piece for Wired, uh, trying to show various cognitive biases that he evinces. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And, and, and it was inspired partly by the sense they do give you. And he sometimes gives you that, uh, you know, they're capable of transcending the psychology of tribalism. But there's, a, there's another related uh, issue I have with, with the IDW that I want to mention, which is that I also just think, by and large, they do have an ideology. They would like to say we're, we're, there is no collective ideology, but it just seems to me their insistence on free and untrammeled speech and their opposition mm-hmm. to attempts to stigmatize uh, people and expel them from the community of discourse is actually a little selective. And I think mm-hmm. uh, the best example also, of this. Well, OK, so here's an example. Also- so so Quillette is kind of the unofficial magazine of the IDW. Right. Uh-huh. And they ran a piece. Yeah. The reason this came to my attention is because it was about somebody I'd had on my show. So on my show, I pride myself on the ideological diversity. Within the last year, you know, I have had conversations with the editor of a socialist magazine, with Bill Crystal, with Brett Stevens, you know, neocons, socialists. Um, the person in, in this case was uh, Max Blumenthal, who was like kind of hard left anti-imperialist. A lot of people don't like him. But again, I try to have a lot of views on my platform. And Quillette uh, did... Uh, a piece on, and you know, he's very against uh, the U.S.'s proxy intervention in Syria and the intervention mm-hmm. of our allies. And uh, in the course of making that case, uh, he talks about, you know, how things look from the Assad regime's perspective and argues that uh, the regime uh, does, doesn't deserve to be as demonized as it's been and so on. He might put it more strongly than that. In any event, it's a, it's a view. I, I I strongly believe that we should be Whenever anyone wants to say this is the way the world looks like from this actor in international politics, Putin, whoever, I think we should just hear them out. You know, you may you may argue they're wrong, whatever. What I don't think we should do is say they should be expelled from the community of discourse because they are, quote, an Assad apologist or a Putin apologist. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yet, Colette, the whole piece was devoted to doing this. The whole piece was devoted to expelling someone from the community of discourse for set for being quote an Assad apologist. And, and so that to me is a perfect example of how selective uh, the, the, the opposition to stigmatizing people with ad hominem attacks can be within the intellectual dark web. Now related question I have, I don't have any such accusation to hurl against rationalists, but I, I do I, I well, I wish my own hobby horse were more widely shared, which is the way human cognitive biases lead to horrible and destructive foreign policy and get us into wars. If if I um and I mentioned this in the podcast with Will, like, you know, if I were to focus, you know, direct the energy of the rationalists on one big problem, I would say this is a big one. We keep doing this, and as a result. Humankind doesn't have the time to focus on the truly important uh, questions, including a lot of questions that nations need to talk about together, you know, controlling biological weapons, arms race in space, pandemics, whatever. Um, And uh, whereas, uh, you know, people like Eliezer Yudkowsky seem to think the most pressing problems are things like what if an AI starts producing paper clips? And doesn't stop, you know, you know, the famous the famous kind of example of AI out of control. It's not something that's not worth thinking about. But I guess uh, and this is this is totally different from what the Cade Metz critique was. But uh, I just wonder if there aren't some important world problems that are not uh, yeah. that could use more attention that, that that are all about irrationalism and cognitive biases and the way. Americans are manipulated by self-serving political leaders that in ways that ultimately wind up being destructive. So sorry, I'll get off. Uh, I'm off my no, soapbox. No. I think that's a really important and interesting question, like how to decide which topics are worth focusing on. Um, and I don't have a complete answer to it. But uh, one piece of the puzzle that I think is worth pointing out is this question of neglectedness. Um, so... Uh, an effective altruist organization that I've worked with and I'm a big fan of is the Open Philanthropy Project. Um, and they, uh, basically, effective altruism is a, a movement um, devoted to trying to figure out how to do the most good possible 
using reason and evidence and so on. Um, and uh, one especially prominent example of an EA organization is GiveWell, um, which relies on randomized controlled trials and, and other kind of hard evidence to try to figure out how much impact different charities have. Um, Open Philanthropy Project is, is not quite as, um, as randomized controlled trial focused. Um, instead, they use kind of a looser framework to figure out which causes are, uh, have the best shot at giving you like a good bang for your charity buck. Um, mm -hmm. And that framework includes three things. Um, I might get the names slightly wrong, but uh, impact, like what's the, the magnitude of the, of the total impact you could have? Um, is it, you know, a problem that's going to affect all of humanity? Is it a problem that's going to affect only a handful of people? Um, impact, uh, tractability, like how much, how plausible is it that, that there's a way we could actually impact this, um, this issue? Uh, if it's something like, I don't know, uh, an asteroid hitting the earth, maybe that's not very track. I don't know. Maybe that is tractable. I'm not sure. Um, but there's some problems that it's hard to do something about. And there's other problems that it's actually very easy to do something about them and have a big, make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Then the third criterion is neglectedness, which is how many other people or other organizations are already working on this? How much, how, you know, how many millions of dollars are already being poured into this question? How many eyeballs are on it already? Yeah. And so I bring this up. Sorry, that was a tangent. Um, but I bring this up to say that this, I think this is a, a decent justification for, you know, at least back in 2008, 2009, when Elias were started writing about, you know, AI risk. I think that's like a decent justification for focusing on it because people it was weren't quite thinking neglected. about it much. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and you may have a different opinion than Eliezer does or than, you know, other experts do about how important is this problem? Like what is actually yeah. the risk from AI in the future and, you know, how concerned should we be about it? Or maybe you might have a different opinion about tractability. Like how much could we actually do about AI risk, you know, now if we're like looking ahead at hypothetical situations in the future, I think those are like legitimate and interesting questions to talk about. But neglectedness is like a big, makes a big difference yeah. when you include it in whether you think this is a worthwhile thing to to write about and talk about. Well, I'd certainly make a case for the, the my foreign policy stuff on grounds of neglectedness. I mean, come to think of it, I almost, I was going to give a talk at some EA conference, I think in San Francisco, wound up not doing EA it, but Global. that was going to be my pitch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to talk about the fact that this is a neglected area, Um for rational thinking in foreign policy. Hmm. Um, I forget why I wound up not doing it. Uh, and, uh, I don't know. Maybe I just chickened out. The, um, <laughs> so, well, um, it sounds worth a piece at least. Well, I, very, I mean, I, I mean, I kind of, I kind of make the argument very, yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't made that argument per se. It's true. Um, yeah. So what do you think we've, uh, I know you've got to, you've got to go in just a few minutes. What do you think like we've 10, missed 10, or, yeah. okay. Uh, are, are the things you would, um, you would add uh, in the interest of fairness or rationality or anything? Um, well, oh, one thing that I had meant to interject about, and then we got sidetracked on another interesting tangent was uh, the, the Rio, uh, sorry, the neo-reactionary, element right um, you, so you're talking about like in the comment section on slate star codex there's yeah, what? reactionaries yeah. and they're like against democracy and and Cade Metz's article focused on that um so i just i wanted to give some context that i thought yeah i nice don't to have I, in the article yeah 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 i would like to hear more about that because i still don't totally get that uh well like, I'm, I'm like not a good person to try to explain neo reaction or anything like that because i'm not very familiar with it the thing that I wanted to say was just that uh, I know there are some people who self-identify as neo-reactionaries who have posted on both Slate Star Codex and Less Wrong, um, but they're very, very rare. So I thought it would have been nice, for example, for the article, like if there's an article about the like political or ideological leanings of uh, of a blog or of the community who you know reads or posts on that blog. Uh, it would have been nice to include some data on what those political leanings actually are, because we have data on that for both Less Wrong and Slate Star Codex. Both blogs have done surveys of their readers where they ask them questions like, where do you identify politically? Um, you know, like what party are you registered to vote with? Like, how would you describe your beliefs? And on both Less Wrong and Slate Star Codex, like by far the, the majority um, political views are left leaning. 
So on Less Wrong, I think it was, I, I might be confusing which was the Less Wrong or the Slate Star Codex poll, but they're not that different. Um, there were like, I don't know, five, four or five times as many people who said they lean left as who said they lean right. Um, and the, the group of people calling themselves, you know, neo reactionaries or I forget what other groups were related, like, like monarchist, I think was one. Yeah. But they were like one percent or less uh-huh. of the total, probably less than that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you could make, I think, an arguable case that less wrong or Scott or no blog should allow anyone who considers themselves a neo reactionary to, participate in conversations. Um, I don't think I would agree with that case, but like you can make that case, but I, yeah. but any discussion of like the neo reactionary leanings or element on uh, these blogs, I think should acknowledge that they're like a very small minority of people in the blogs, the, the communities in general who read these blogs are left wing. Right. It's just, it's just important context. Sure. Yeah. And, and it's like, I didn't even, understand like why would they be connected to the rationalist community and that's why i use the term philosopher king because to the best i could guess it was that well democracies so often do irrational things it would be better if we had just one super smart person telling everybody what what to do that was my kind of assumption it's it's certainly true democracies do irrational things but uh at the same time uh concentrations of power uh are dangerous the answer might just be a more boring answer which is that uh, a, a blog about, you know, taking weird ideas seriously uh, and and like uh, giving a hearing to people who are at least willing to abide by these rules of discourse, even if their views are very fringe, like a blog like that is going to attract people with lots of different kinds of weird beliefs. Right. Um, and so like neo reactionaries are one of them. Um, but uh, I don't know. Like far left uh, anarcho capitalists. Oh, my my like lack of political savvy is going to show I'm not remembering the right names for um, all the fringe groups. But, you know, there like there are people, for example, um, who are definitely overrepresented in the like rationalist, less wrong SSC community who think that wild animal suffering is a serious problem that we should be paying more attention to. Like mm-hmm. We should be finding ways to intervene and prevent wild animals from suffering from starvation or predation. Well, um, you mean out, out in the view. wild, like out in yes, the wild, out in the wild. That yes. would be a big job. It would be. It would be a big job. Most people think that's ludicrous. A ludicrous thing to even care about. Be a dangerous um, job. And <laughs> lots of criticisms you can make of it. Um, my point is just that that's another weird view that is overrepresented in these communities. Um, but it's also like an interesting, it's actually an interesting idea. I mean, that I will quickly dismiss on grounds of practicality, but still an interesting, an interesting point that's, you know, Logically, in a way, inspired by the fact that there's a massive amount of suffering out in the wild and that that has, in fact, yeah. been the price of the creation of the human species and all others. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the uh, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but um, I, I think like one of the main premises of that case is that people tend to dismiss the importance of doing something about wild animal suffering on the grounds that it's natural. Like wild animal suffering is natural and it is. And so this this viewpoint is basically saying, like, just because something bad is natural is not a good enough reason to not try to prevent it or fix it. Right. So um, anyway, I. Oh, yeah, there was one other thing I wanted to say, if you're not um, if you if you didn't want to lobby to start a new tangent or a new thread. Uh, I, I, I'm it, it's the, the stage is yours. OK, thank you. So I just wanted to say, you know, we've been talking about this question of should there be like free untrammeled um, speech, even about, even like given to people who have uh, unsavory or like wrong or dangerous views. Um, And there was one, uh, one thing that Will kind of touched on in his critique of the rationalist or a critique of the rationalist reaction to the New York Times article. This is in the piece he wrote on his uh, newsletter? Yes, model, I think so. model, yes. model citizen, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's like, it's a point that other people have touched on too, but I, I like wanted to give Will some credit for touching on it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, which is that there is a risk. Like if you, if you as a community or just you as a person are really bending over backwards to try to be charitable to the views of people who disagree with you, 
um, and not, you know, dismiss something just because it sounds weird or unsavory um, and not dismiss someone, um, not dismiss someone's claim about X just because you disagree with them about Y. If you're trying to do all of that and like, you know, interpret them charitably and not write them off, you are going to be vulnerable to, to some extent to, you know, what do you want, I want to call it? Like manipulation or, um, or propaganda from, from like unsavory or dangerous types. Mm -hmm. Um, Because even if you're trying to do your best to like evaluate their claims carefully, um, there's a limit to which you could, there's a limit to the extent to which you can do that perfectly or thoroughly. And so if you're letting people who you have good reason to think are like unsavory or, or have bad intentions, if, if you're trying to just evaluate all of their claims, forgetting about the fact that they're unsavory characters, um, if you're not doing a perfect job of evaluating them, there's some stuff that's going to get through that maybe you're not going to recognize right. as wrong, um, that you're going to end up believing or at least like taking seriously. And, and I think that's a, a legitimate concern about the policy of like, the rationalist discourse norms. Um, and it's one that I've kind of changed my mind about to some extent in the last five, six years as well, that like, this is more of a serious concern than I had recognized before. You mean um, it, it is actually a problem? No, it is, it, it's like, a, it's a, like an actual potential downside or risk to these rationalist discord, no, discourse norms that I love and cherish so much. Um, but are you thinking think there probably, should be more of a filter or just that it's something you have to live with because you cherish the norm? I mean, I think probably where I and like the wills of the world would disagree, not to put words in his mouth, but my guess is that I would say he's like not worried enough about the other, um, uh, about the, like the problem on the other, like the, he's not worried enough about the problem that the rationalists are trying to correct mm-hmm. for with this policy, which mm-hmm. is the, the risk of, you know, being too dismissive of people whose ideas seem weird or being too dismissive of ideas um, just because they're like associated with something that's wrong, yeah. um, even if those ideas themselves might be wrong. Um, and in my opinion, humans in general tend to err way too much on that side. They tend to err way too much on the side of like dismissing people or ideas just because they come from the wrong tribe um, or because they sound weird. And so I still think that on net, the rationalist policy of like trying to compensate for that leads to better results. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm not, I don't want to claim that it's, you know, completely um, that it has like all benefits and no costs. Yeah, um, I, I think, I mean, I can't speak for Will either. I think maybe one thing he believes that I kind of agree with, I don't know if he put it this way. There have always been speech codes in all known societies, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, things that were beyond the pale. And it, and it may be that some of the codes, and here I'm not even thinking necessarily about substantively significant ones, like the N word, for example. There's no there's no idea you can't express without using that word, without just saying N word instead. There's no sure. nothing conceptual. And so, to my mind, that's an example of a speech code uh, that you know, given the, the the challenges of having a multi ethnic society, given America's distinctive history in this particular regard, you know. Uh, I'm on board with. And uh, I, I think when people um, this is why I didn't like the movie, The Aristocrats. Did you see that documentary? It was, it was about yeah. that famous joke. Oh, it was like about that. it was Here's... like the idea that that transgression of norms is just a good thing in itself. Yeah. Even if no even if no substantive value you know, is added. And, and, and like, even if there if are the incendiary, funnier, effects, it would have made a good, well, that's the other thing is, is the only guy who did a good job with the joke was George Carlin. I thought, but anyway, the, um, uh, the, uh, remember his? Yeah. uh the, the, um, so uh, that's kind of a thing of mine. I don't, that, I don't think that's all Will is saying, but I do think he's saying, you yeah. know, you should, you should be mindful of the, of the natural understandable sensibilities of particular groups of people and do not gratuitously, um, throw fuel onto the fire, um, which I firmly I, believe. Yeah, I'd sign on to that, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, that's separate from the question of whether there should, there, there should be substantive uh, areas that are that are out of bounds, which I, I – and I assume their – the rationalist response is pretty uniformly no, right? Like um, areas of inquiry, uh, you know, that, that just Charles be Murray. Discussed. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I'm trying to think of like potential weird exceptions or fringe cases or something. 
Um, I mean, I would agree at least that, okay, I would agree at least that, that in many contexts, it's reasonable to have uh, restrictions on like what you can discuss. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a stronger claim to say that no one should ever in any context, in any venue, even like, you know, a blog comment section or something, no one should ever be allowed to discuss whatever subject X. Mm -hmm. That's like a much stronger claim that I'd be much more hesitant to sign on to. I don't know, maybe like uh, nuclear codes or, (laughs) or like, or information that is like genuinely directly dangerous to large numbers of people or something. Right. I'd be willing to, those are like the, you know, yelling fire in a, in a movie theater type exceptions or something. Right. But if we're not talking about those kinds of edge cases, then I, I don't think I'd be willing to accept like I, I mean, a the, blanket universal ban on subjects. There's also, of course, the distinction between the government prohibiting things, which is a First Amendment issue, and, and social uh, norms, and, and say the New York Times saying, if you say the N word, you're gone, which it, it has the legal right to do, and is not a First Amendment issue per se. Um, I, Although in, in that case, there's a separate issue about the weird adjudication process where the guy clear, was cleared the first time, but then, uh, the O'Neill? News, yeah, yeah. Then the newsroom, yeah, yeah. uh, rendered a thumbs down verdict and they revisited the first adjudicatory process, yeah. which is what I think is, uh, is kind of indefensible about it. But, um, so, uh, thanks. Um, let's, uh, let's, uh, mention again at your blog. I mean, your podcast, Rationally Speaking. Now, are you still president of the Center for Applied Rationality? No, no. I co-founded that okay. in, uh, in 2012. And then I left in 2016. Uh-huh. Um, and part of what I've been doing since I left is I've been writing a book, which is oh, coming good. out next month. Oh, well, I don't know when this is going to air, but it's coming out April 13th. Um, and it's very relevant to what we've been talking about today. So I wanted to What's it get called? in a plug for it. It's called The Scout Mindset, which Excellent. is my term for... Um, the motivation to see the world um, as accurately as possible or to see things as they are and not as you wish they were. Um, and it's a, the, the framing metaphor of the book is that basically by default, humans are often in what I call soldier mindset, which is the motivation to defend your, you know, preexisting huh. or cherished beliefs against huh. evidence or arguments that might threaten them. Yeah. Um, and so scout mindset is like an alternative to that um, because a scout's job is not to attack or defend. A scout's job is to, go out and uh, get as accurate a map of reality as possible. It's why the so CIA, the book is all about, it's why yeah. the CIA should not have ideologues working in it. Although sometimes it does. That, right. that, that is a good, uh, a good mm-hmm. tie in. Yeah. Not, not to bring um, us back to foreign policy, but um, the, the, uh, <laughs> you should no, write that, sounds, that article, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds, uh, that sounds great. So people could go to Amazon right now and, 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 and boost your uh, your numbers, right? Which they should do. They could. That's the thing they could do. Yeah. I mean, you would that be would too be modest great. to suggest that, but I think it would be a good <laughs> idea. Um, I wouldn't protest too hard. Uh, I'll, I'll put it that way. So it's called the Scout um, Mindset. Yeah. It's called the Scout Mindset, and it's all it's about why are humans by default in soldier mindset? Like, what purpose mm-hmm. is it serving us? Um, it's my case for why we would be better off shifting from soldier towards scout. Um, and it also has a lot of, like, practical advice on how to become more of a scout. Um, lots of stories, lots of anecdotes, lots of kind of practical tips. Um, and it's, I, I hope, an easy read. And it's, it's coming out in mere weeks. Mere weeks, yes. So even people, people who, who do only instant gratification could defensibly go to Amazon and buy it. I mean, weeks isn't long. It's that won't be long. Gratification. It's true. Uh, so I recommend that. Recommend your uh, podcast. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, just Julia Galef. First name, okay. last name. G A L E F. I mm-hmm. am Robert Ryder on Twitter, and as long as I'm plugging my stuff, I put out the Non-Zero newsletter, which lately has become home of the uh, Apocalypse Aversion Project. Something where uh, I, I assume you'll yeah. sign on to averting the apocalypse. Is a sounds great. You're on board. I'm yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. We'll see if, uh, thank you. we'll see if this I face another round of complaints. Uh, <laughs> and if so, I will do my best to make amends with, with, uh, yet another, another guest. Just but, send the complainers my way. And any mistakes in this conversation were my responsibility. I don't think that's what they'll complain about. Judging by experience, <laughs> uh, the, the complaints will be directed toward me. I'm happy to entertain them, but thanks a lot, Julia. This is, this is really illuminating. It was super fun.
Till next okay. time. All right. Bye, Bob. Bye-bye.